The second portion of this public meeting of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners is being held by teleconference under Government Code Section 11133 and in person at the Department of Consumer Affairs Headquarters Hearing Room in Sacramento. Again, the date is Friday, August 19th, 2022. Time is 9.07. Members of the public that would like to provide public comment will be limited to three minutes unless in the board the discretion of the board circumstances require a longer period. Members of the public will not be permitted to yield their allotted time to other members of the public to make comments. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio and video recorded for live webcast. Please turn off or silence all cell phones and we will now take roll call. Mr. Sweet, would you please call the roll? Yes. Dr. Paris? Present. Dr. Adams? Present. Rafael Sweet? Present. Ms. Cruz? Present. Dr. Daniels? Present. For the quorum. Thank you, Mr. Sweet. We can move to agenda item number five, board chair report. Um, just a brief update on uh, the board's activities since we've last met. Um, our former board member, Dion McLean, represented the BCE at the annual Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Boards Conference and the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners meeting in Denver, Colorado on May 4th to the 8th, 2022. And as you're all aware, she um, is no longer with the board. She has since resigned. Uh, Kristen Walker was appointed as the board's executive officer, effective May 23rd, 2022. Congratulations again. Following the May board meeting, the board's fee proposal was submitted to the legislature and included in our sunset bill, SB 1434. Um, this will be discussed later under agenda item 10. Uh, throughout the summer, we also have met with stakeholders to discuss the restructuring of our fees and concerns with the CE course application fee, as well as opportunities for improving our existing procedures. Um, and I think that has gone really well, and I, I anticipate that will be something we continue to do in the future. We've also met with representatives from Life University to discuss California curriculum and licensure requirements. Um, we've also uh, begun the process of developing items for discussion by the newly formed licensing committee. Yesterday, uh, day one of the board meeting, uh, we had a very productive session and we reviewed our mission, vision, values. Uh, we developed approximately 18, I think exactly 18 objectives in five main goal areas for our 2023 to 2026 strategic plan. The board's expected to review uh, this plan and update it uh, during its October meeting. Will be ratified at the October meeting? Yes, if the board agrees with the draft. You also have an opportunity if you want to make any changes at that point before it's formally adopted for 2023. Thank you. Are there any questions from uh, board members? Uh, question. Uh, in reviewing, um, as it's being developed, um, I imagine it's uh, our first look at it will be right before the board meeting. Is that kind of the time frame? Um, as soon as we have a draft of the plan, I'm going to distribute it out to the board so you can begin looking at it um, and formulate your thoughts. And then I know during the, during the session yesterday, as far as the timing, they had talked about putting together the draft plan for the board to see in October and then work with staff on the action plan. I'm, I'm going to check in with Solid about us um, not only providing you with the plan, but then just a very preliminary action plan as well for review so that at the October meeting, if we're seeing any gaps or additional objectives, we can address them at that time um, before we have the formal action plan in place. Any other questions, comments from board members? Hearing none, moderator, can we please open agenda item number five for a public comment? 
This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, uh, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, thank you. Moving on to agenda item number six, review and possible approval of board meeting minutes. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes from April 21st, 22nd, 2022, May 20th, 2022, and August 4th, 2022. A motion that we accept the minutes as outlined. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion amongst the board members? Hearing none, moderator, can we please open up agenda item number six for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, thank you. I will restate the motion. Uh, uh, motion is to approve the April, May, and August board meeting minutes from previous board meetings. Uh, motion was previously seconded. Can Mr. Sweet, could we please call for the vote? Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. L. Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Motion carries. Minutes approved. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number seven, ratification of approved doctor of chiropractic license applications. I would entertain a motion to approve to ratify the list of approved license applications. I'll move to ratify the attached list of approved license applications. Thank you, is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Any comment or discussion from the board members? Hearing none, moderator, would you please open up agenda item number seven for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, uh, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, thank you. Mr. Sweet, would you please call for the vote? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Rafael Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number eight, ratification of approved continuing education provider applications. I would entertain a motion to ratify the following new CE providers. Uh, 
I'll move to ratify the application of uh, CE providers. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Any comment or discussion? Yes. I, I have a few concerns about some of these and perhaps maybe some clarification from staff. Um, but there was uh, one person on here that uh, uh, is dealing with wealth management. And I'm curious. What might their focus be or aspects since we're not doing C for Okay. Um, at this point, all we have is the application, which is enclosed in your packet, and it just gives us the name, their CE oversight contact person, and their contact information. Um, so we don't know what kind of courses they're going to have. Um, this is all that's required um, at this point in time in our regulations to become a CE provider. So we don't have authority to dig any deeper um, for approval um, to become a chiropractic, uh, a CE provider, sorry. So they, they, they don't give any indication at all and that's not something that's requested? No, in our regs, all they have to do is fill out this form with the information on it and um, you guys, you know, decide to approve them or not. So we don't have any idea what the scope of their courses are going to be at this point in time because they can't submit course applications until after they are an approved provider. And do we check on the, where they hold their license if they are if they're a chiropractor? Are we checking to see that they're licensed in the state of California? No, um, the law does not require CE providers to be uh, licensed chiropractors or to hold a license at all. I have no other questions. Just expressing concern over that. I share your concerns. Um, I have another, uh, I noticed also that multiple applications um, seem to be handwritten um, and relatively legible, but ripe for errors or omissions. And and I'm wondering if uh, these forms are are they type type through PDFs or what does this look like on there and when they're filling these out? Um, the majority of our forms are not fillable, um, so we do receive them handwritten. So, eat, so if they type, if they pull the form up, there the typing that's in there is not from a like a type through PDF. This is them finding a way to fill out the document. I think it depends on what. Uh, sorry, I'm not very tech savvy, but what they have on their computer in order to allow them to fill out a form or not. But generally, the forms on our website are not um, fillable and savable. Yeah. And I, because I also noticed too that the, with the emails, they tend to run outside of the margins yes. of our forms. Um, so, I, what I would like to do is um, I would like to make a motion that the CE committee discuss and review the application process for CE providers and that's inclusive of, um, well, I think just review the whole process and then also inclusive of um, taking a look at uh, the ease and efficiency of being able to include type through PDF forms on our website. Um, so there, there isn't a motion needed for that. That's not all quite exactly in our scope in this agenda item. However, your staff is taking copious notes and they can bring that back at a future board meeting or committee meeting wherever that's appropriate. Okay. Yeah. So we don't need a motion to have it put on the CE committee agenda. Correct. Okay, gotcha. And I think those issues, some of those issues are already being addressed with the comprehensive review. Is that right, Kristen? That's correct. And um, the concerns being expressed now kind of illustrate the need for moving that portion of the package forward. I concur. 
with uh, your yeah. comments. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Is there any additional comment from the board members? I guess my, my question after this is approved, is there any other vetting after this point that occurs? Um, the majority of the vetting comes from the course applications that they submit thereafter. So we can either approve or deny their course in whole or in part. Um, and also if they are found to be doing something um, not in compliance with the CE regulations, we do have authority to um, pull their providership. But it's, um, the regulations are pretty vague at this point in time, so there's definitely some um, improvements that need to be made. Thank you. Any other comment from board members? Moderator, can we please open agenda item number eight for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit the requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, thank you. Hearing no additional comment from the board, Mr. Sweet, would you please call for the vote? Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Rafael Sweet? Yes. yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number nine, executive officer's report and updates. I will turn it over to Ms. Walker. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna provide a brief program update on what's occurred since the April meeting when you got your last update. Um, as far as this time of the year, um, the primary focus internally is um, going through the end of the fiscal year and then working on developing our annual statistics um, of note, over the last fiscal year, the board reviewed and approved 1,824 CE course applications, which is a slight reduction from the prior two fiscal years where we were just below 2,000 annual course applications received. Um, we're also in, we're preparing to resume our CE audits in September, beginning with the licensees that renewed in July of 2022, and then reaching back to cover any um, COVID era um, waivers and extensions for um, when we had paused that program. So we're gonna be not only resuming the audits, but we're gonna be looking back three years to really get the full picture of um, the licensees uh, continuing education within that time frame. As far as from our licensing program, as you can see in the statistics in the board meeting packet, we're continuing to just see the steady decline in our licensee population. While we've been welcoming new doctors of chiropractic in and issuing them licenses, we're still seeing just um, a trickling effect of the overall licensee population um, declining over that same time frame. As far as the enforcement program, um, they've been steadily focused on completing their cases and um, notably during the last fiscal year, they reduced their pending caseload to 360, where it had been at 511 at the end of the last fiscal year. So they not only kept up with their workload, um, but then they were able to make a sizable decrease in the number of pending cases. Also notable within that time frame, um, we filed 53 accusations and we currently have 107 pending disciplinary cases, which is very high when looking at historical data and from that, we expect to see a significant amount of disciplinary cases um, either being uh, resolved through stipulated settlements or um, perhaps proceeding to hearing during this current fiscal year as a result. As far as the um, updates with our enforcement program, our unit uh, began a project with the department's organizational improvement office to evaluate the board's complaint intake, desk investigation, and field investigation processes and to identify strategies to improve productivity, reduce investigation timeframes, 
and provide excellent customer service to those involved in our consumer complaint process. Through a series of meetings with the OIO staff, um, they mapped our existing processes, and then they also worked on developing some preliminary recommendations which were presented to management last month, and we expect to fully implement uh, the recommendations resulting from this project by the end of the year. As far as staff updates, our formal, former policy analyst, Andrea McMillan, had accepted a promotional uh, position over at the Department of Justice, and her last day with BCE was July 1st. And then over the summer, our temporary support staff, Linda Brown, Trenton Burden, and Kelly Seguenza also completed their assignments and moved to other opportunities while Linda uh, rejoined her retirement. Um, and we're currently working with Human Resources to complete our reorganization of staff and then, com then complete the recruitment to fill vacancies under our new structure. Are there any questions on the internal operations of the board before I move to the budget? Um, I just had a question on what you were just reviewing as far as the enforcement statistics. Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed in the um, fees assessed and fees collected through the years that gap has widened and I was just wondering if um, you could uh, talk about that. Okay, sure. Um, I can, I'm going to have to look a little bit closer on that that current gap there, but what that captures um, is the fines that were assessed, but then also collected within that fiscal year. Um, and I do know that towards the end of the fiscal year, we issued a number of citations that then sometimes they're not paid timely, so it's not reflected in the collected until the next fiscal year. Occasionally, we'll find even data where, um, like even looking at year 1819, we collected more money than we assessed, and that's just due to the differing timeframes. But we can look into that further and report back. Any other questions on the internal operations before I move to the budget? This morning, um, we distributed a handout with the board's uh, fund and budget condition. Um, looking at that analysis, there, there haven't been any significant changes from the reports we've been providing at prior board meetings. Um, it, is a, it is a little bit more optimistic than what we had at the last board meeting because now looking at um, the overall condition of the fund, while you still see clearly the, uh, the decreasing fund balance over time showing that it's imbalanced, um, our months in reserve are a little bit, and we're in a little bit better place than we were at the last meeting, and we're not actually projecting insolvency now until uh, fiscal year 2024-25, where previously that insolvency was um, projected to occur during the next fiscal year in 2023-24. Um, we are, although the fiscal year has now ended, um, the budget office is still compiling all the, the numbers for that year, so we expect to report that to the board in October. But at this time, this is capturing as of fiscal month 11, so we're looking at data as of projected by May. But we don't expect any real surprises when we incorporate June and then closing out the budget year. Uh, question. Oh. What, uh, what appears to be the difference um, between kind of before and now where you say we're in a better position? Um, the revenue is the revenue is slightly higher than was originally projected and are as we get closer and closer to the end of the year when we're um, when we're allocating what we expect to spend, we get a little bit more accurate because we have to budget kind of conservatively and expect that we're going to expend so it's more forecasting kind of yeah. Okay. When, when do you expect the fee increases to go through if they do get approved? Those would, those would be effective, you said, January 1, 2023? Correct, yeah. So the, under the sunset bill, um, with the fee increase, that would all become effective, like you said, at the beginning of the next calendar year. So it will be reflected in about half of this current fiscal year's budget, but we're not going to see the full impact until we get into next fiscal year, where that entire year includes the new rate. So it's anticipated that if those fee increases go through, that that's going to substantially change this all the way around. Correct. Thank you.
Okay. Moving on to the next portion of my update um, is relating to the board's Connect project. So we've been co continuing to collaborate with um, other programs on the implementation of the Connect system. Um, as of this spring, we completed the formal project phase and we've now moved into what's being referred to as maintenance and operations where rather than building a lot of new scope, we're looking at what's existing in the system and enhancing it to make it uh, more user friendly and accessible. What we're really focusing on during this phase is really enhancing that user experience for applicants and licensees so that we can increase our system utilization rate. Um, and then we're also building and implementing the continuing education provider and course application functionality and planning to integrate that in with the licensee records. Um, next week, we've scheduled um, a demo with some other programs that have already implemented continuing education in their system so we can try to find some opportunities to leverage existing functionality to kind of help save on resources for the project. Um, and th that remains the two primary focuses. It's just really getting the system um, dialed in so that we can hopefully move to getting more licensees to renew on that system. Any questions on the Connect project? And the last portion of my update is just an update on our uh, rulemaking packages. So over the summer, we've been evaluating the language of the pending packages and then working with our regulatory legal counsel to set priorities. Um, we've also been preparing discussion items for the future committee meetings this fall. Um, and I'm happy to report that we've made some progress on our delegation of authority regulations, as well as um, the concepts around CE and the Consumer Protection Enforcement Initiative, CPEI regulations. Unless there are any questions, that concludes my update for today. Any further questions, comments from the board? Hearing none, moderator, can we please open agenda item number nine for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. Any additional comment, question from the board members? I, I do have one um, additional question. I, I seem to be noticing um, there's a trend towards more citations, and I don't, is that a byproduct of uh, COVID issues and some of the advertising issues that we were asked about during sunset review. And I, I've also noticed seemingly that the, the citations seem to have more violations. It seemingly in the past they were one or two and now there's like five or six. And I don't know if that's if something, if we're looking at these differently or if that's a trend or it just is an anomaly in this packet. Um, so there's two issues. Um, as far as the citations that are being issued out, um, the staff has been working really diligently to complete um, their investigations and then they're forwarding cases to experts so we're getting their opinions. Um, and while we're finding that in a lot of these cases, it doesn't rise to the level where discipline's appropriate, we're issuing citations. So there's been a push to get, get that work pushed out and you're seeing it reflect in either accusations filed, if it was rose to that level or if it was less egregious, those are um, going through with citations. And as far as the number of violations, um, some of our experts, they just tend to, um, they will identify a number of issues or there's, there's one set of facts, but it violates or overlaps multiple regulations. So in an effort to be educational as well as the licensee will cite all of the relevant regulations rather than trying to just pick one. Understood, thank you. Dr. Paris? 
Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question on the connect. What do we feel our licensees are, how aware are they of the connect project and um, being able to access that? So with the Connect project itself, um, we're excited to be in the maintenance phase where we can really enhance the system because we haven't done a lot in the way of outreach of notifying them of the system, but then we're also aware of um, while it's minimally, it's, it's functional, it's not, it's not at the level of polish where it, it just feels intuitive to use the system. So our plan is to um, to address those enhancements and make it a more user-friendly system. And then once we get to that point where we've got reliability and ease of access, the plan is to get the outreach out to the licensees to really encourage the push because the benefit of using that system is when you renew online, your license is renewed within one or two days versus the weeks it takes in the mail. Um, and then we would also be bringing something eventually to the licensing committee and we're talking further down the line to consider um, rather than even submitting paper renewals, some other boards will just send a postcard and tell them to go online and renew and then tell them where they can get a paper application if they need it. Thank you. And do we have a sort of estimated time of when we think that that'll be ready? Um, as of now, it's, we've set it as our top priority. So we're planning to roll out the enhancements in the fall. I don't, they're not going to be ready for the next release in September. So we're probably looking around November to get those implemented in the system. Okay, great. Thank you. Any additional comments from board members? Hearing none, move to agenda item number 10. We'll have an update discussion and possible action on legislation. I'll turn it over to Ms. Walker. Thank you. Um, since the time that the meeting packets were prepared, um, last week was a very busy week for the legislature as they were um, moving things from appropriations committee. It either made it out and survived or it got stuck. So as far as um, today's update, the majority of these items are purely just an update item. Many of them were held under submission but um, we do have plenty of time this morning, so I think it's helpful to still discuss some of them um, as we may see them again next session. Uh, the first bill, uh, Assembly Bill uh, 646 Low, um, relates to expunged convictions. This is one that last week on October, or I'm sorry, August 11th, it was held under submission at the Senate Appropriations Committee. So it will not be moving forward this year, but we will likely see something similar during a future session. Um, this bill would have required the Department of Consumer Affairs boards with information on its online license search system that a license was revoked due to a conviction to upon, um, upon receipt of a certified copy of an expungement order to either post the notification of that expungement order or remove that initial posting with that information. As far as from the board's perspective, while we understand um, that the need for um, providing more access to opportunities by not having that type of information out there. We also have concerns about what that reflects when you're looking at a licensee's disciplinary history because you're not seeing the full picture if we're then having to remove certain information or mask it from our public online license search system. Um, the board had previously discussed this at its July 2021 board meeting and decided to watch the bill. The board maintained this position at the last meeting in May and um, as far as today, no action is needed. Staff will be monitoring for something similar in the future. Are there any comments or questions on this bill? Okay. Seeing none, I'll move to the next one. Um, Assembly Bill 1662 Gibson um, had to do with uh, basically establishing a process for prospective applicants for licensure to request a pre-application determination from the board as to whether their criminal history information could be cause for denial of an application for licensure by the board and then public, publish information about this process on its website. Um, as far as this bill, the board um, recognized the benefit of providing prospective applicants with an opportunity to, to find out if their criminal history information could prevent them from obtaining license before they invest in an expensive education program. Um, one of the concerns with the bill as written was um, that for, to conduct the fingerprint record check, it was limited to the boards um, authorized by Business and Professions Code Section 144, Subdivision B, which the board is not currently listed in. So at the May meeting, the board voted to support the bill if it's amended to authorize the board to conduct that fingerprint background check for the prospective applicant. 
um, prior while they're seeking that pre-application determination. As with the prior bill, um, this bill did not make it out of the Appropriations Committee this year, so we'll be watching for something similar during the next session. Any questions on 1662? Another bill that was discussed in May was AB 1733 Cork, and it had to do with um, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. This would, have, um, this would have made some changes to remove some provisions that require each teleconference location to be noticed and instead and accessible to the public and instead require the state body to adhere to certain specified requirements such as holding all open meetings by teleconference, um, ensuring the public has a means to hear, observe, and address the state body during the meeting, providing at least one physical location where they can participate, and then providing information in the agenda on how how to access the meeting. And one of the provisions within this would have ensured that if one of the remote, if the means of remote participation failed, the meeting must adjourn. Um, this bill did not move forward out of committee um, and we'll be monitoring for something future, something similar in the future. But when you look at what we've put on the agenda, we put, um, I'm gonna skip just ahead to item E, Senate Bill 189 was the budget bill and included within that bill was similar provisions to extend through July 1st of 2023. Um, the remote meeting provisions that we had become accustomed to during uh, the pandemic where um, we no longer needed to state the physical public locations and it allows the board members to participate from private locations without making those accessible to the public. So that's, that's the in-between, but we're gonna continue to monitor for something similar to 1733 during the next session. I have a I have a question. Would that would that mandate that there is um, always at least one public location, like here at DCA? And so. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what was currently in Bagley Keen. Anyways, is that you'd have to have a public meeting okay. location. Um, but what was what was unique about 1733 is that um, it would require also that all meetings would be teleconference. So we'd have to open up like we have today, the WebEx portion. So we're, it would pretty much mandate a hybrid meeting or exclusively through WebEx with a public viewing location rather than what we have. Today, we would have had the option to just simply have an in-person meeting without the live teleconference going on. Thank you. Um, Assembly Bill 2790, WICS, has to do with um, mandating reporting requirements for healthcare practitioners. Um, this bill, once again, this one was also held under submission um, in the Senate Appropriations Committee. It's not moving forward this year, but we, we wanted to bring it to the board's attention um, just due to the fact that it hadn't been previously discussed at a meeting. But this bill would, would have removed a requirement for healthcare practitioners to report to law enforcement when they know or reasonably suspect a patient has suffered physical injury caused by assaultive or abusive conduct and instead require the practitioner to provide brief counseling, education or other support and a warm handoff as defined or referral to local and national domestic violence or sexual violence advocacy services. So this is one that, while it doesn't directly impact the board or its operations, it definitely affects the licensees and um, it's something that staff definitely recommends watching and we wouldn't be too surprised if we see something similar during the next session. So we want to make sure to bring it to the board's attention, although um, there's no action needed today. I just have a comment on that. I, I think the potential, and this is just, you know, from a perspective of opening up, I guess, a potential can of worms is that to, to require us as licensees to, to, to be in that position, that, that's very nebulous. You know, a warm handoff, uh, provide counseling, I mean, ourselves or, you know, I mean, it's, it, maybe there's more in depth. When I read that, I thought, I think that's something that we should, in my opinion, not just to take a no position, that we should be like, no, that's not really our role as chiropractors to, to, to be in that. It, we should be reporting that to those that are 
you know, skilled in that area and, and licensed in that area, which we are not. And I, I agree with you. We're going to watch for, um, or lastly, we'll, we'll monitor for similar legislation in the future, and we're going to ensure to bring it to the board's attention much earlier so that you can be involved in the process and, you know, opine and provide a position if necessary. It, and also, can I request that we um, reach out to our, uh, the colleges, our stakeholders there, and just ask them if, if any of the educational programs believe that they're including this type of, um, you know, this type of education, um, being able to, you know, do that brief counseling, or is, is any of that in part of any of the educational programs, in, especially in California? Definitely, we'll reach out. That'd be good information to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would say I do not believe that it is, but I, I think we should ask them and, um, and maybe also uh, get their opinion. The other, um, the next one on the agenda is uh, Senate Bill 1237 Newman relating to um, licensees in military service. This bill uh, simply clarifies the definition of active duty for purposes of an individual called to active duty as a member of the armed forces or National Guard. Um, this bill had, had passed on um, August 11th and it's currently waiting, awaiting the governor's signature. And the final bill is, um, is the one that's most important to us is uh, Senate Bill 1434 Roth. This is our sunset bill. So just to give an overview of how we got to this bill today, um, this is included as part of our sunset process. So as you recall, at the end of, or actually early 2022, we submitted our written uh, sunset review report with an extensive overview of the board's operations over the last four years. Um, then in the spring, the, uh, the committees issued a background paper basically summarizing what they had found within the report and identifying specific issues um, that they found from the board. On March 7th, uh, Dr. Paris and I appeared before the committees to participate in, um, in a session where we were answering their questions. And then following that, we provided written responses to each of those issues. Then um, Senator Roth, as chair of the committee, um, authored a bill relating to our sunset where they were including provisions to improve our operations. Um, and at the time, we didn't have the formal fee structure and proposal worked out at that point. So there, it began with language directing us to provide them with a status update on our implementation of fees. Um, and then following the May 20th board meeting, we submit, formally submitted our proposal as voted on by the board for inclusion in the bill. And it was amended on June 20th of 2022 to include the, the proposal that was voted and approved by the board on May 20th. Um, so now under this bill, it does a number of things. Um, it extends our sunset review date out until January 1st of 2027, giving us the four-year extension, which is um, the longest period that they'll give you when you're looking at when you're gonna be renewed, reviewed next. Um, it modernizes the board's directory by requiring that we include telephone numbers and email addresses of licensees in our directory and requiring licensees to immediate, immediately notify us of a change in their contact information. Um, staff finds this to be helpful because it's gonna, in, it's gonna improve our customer service to licensees because if we have minor issues, we'll be able to get a hold of them rather than by mail, but we can make a quick phone call or send them an email as well to hopefully resolve the issue faster. Um, this bill, in addition to, this, this bill also removes those specified exemptions from the probation status disclosure requirement, thereby enhancing and protecting consumers because it's gonna remove um, the unnecessary exemptions that allow licensees to not make that disclosure when they're meeting a new patient. And then as I stated, it also includes the updated fee schedule by the board, and then it includes um, a directive that we submit a report to the policy and fiscal committees with an update on the board's license fee structure and whether the board needs to consider plans for restructuring its fees by 2027. Ms. Walker, can you go over um, what was amended from the matrix suggested fee schedule? 
Sure. Um, so there was, as far as going from the matrix report to what made it in the bill, the majority of the numbers identified by matrix for the fixed fees made it into the bill. Um, the major change was the, rather than going with a flat rate of, I believe it was $558 for the continuing education course application fee, it shifted to an hourly rate of $116 per hour of instruction. So rather than charging just one flat rate, we're now assessing fees based on how many hours of instruction are included within that course. Um, the other things that were added in addition was under the matrix study, it was just a flat fixed rate fee for everything and just a, a flat table. Um, we've requested and they've included in the bill authority for the board to lower any of those regulations or any of those fees by regulation, as well as authority for the doctor of chiropractic annual license renewal fee, which is the primary source of the board's funding to, while it will be set at $336 initially, it includes authority for the board to raise it by regulation up to $500 if necessary to maintain the solvency of our fund. Can you explain what, when you say by regulation, when you say that by regulation we can lower any fees that we determine or raise the license fee? I, I remember that part, but then you're talking about the other fees that we had could be lowered. When you say by regulation, can you eliminate me on that? Sure. So through, through the regulatory process. So we would need to develop a regulation that set a fee that was lower than what's in that statute. And then we would need to go through the process through the Office of Administrative Law to formally get the regulation package approved and within that justify the reason. So if we found, um, you know, and ideally if through the Connect project we realized efficiencies in one area and it was no longer necessary that we charge a certain fee amount for a service, that would be our justification. We would have to put together a package and get it passed through regulation to set that fee lower than what's specified in statute. And could it also be like what we did with the license by regulation that we could say, for example, there was a lot of question discussion about the $116 hourly fee for continuing education. And we got feedback from, from the state association from some of the colleges about, well, that's, you know, may be tough for some of us. And so if we determine through efficiencies that, you know, that would we also be able to say lower it, but also can be increased like we did with the licensing fee, can be increased to this if circumstances change? Not quite, but what the statute's doing is it, it's setting the $116 per hour of instruction basically is your cap. So if you're going to go lower, you would do a regulation and just fix what that fee would be and explain why that's appropriate and then get that through and passed. And then if you need to change it again, you've still got leniency to go up to $116 per hour. You just can't go any higher. So you can okay. continue that process, but it would stay in regulation, but you wouldn't set a regulation giving yourself authority but to move it. In a it. sense, it does give you that, that freedom. Okay, that's, yeah. that's what I was asking is that, you, it, you know, it, I think that's a, a trend that's happening in a lot of these boards is that giving yourself some room without having to spend that, because going through the OAL is going to probably be, what, a minimum of six to 12 months? It is, yeah, but, um, and with with the legislature on fees, the benefit of getting the, the DC license and having the ceiling at $500 is it gives us long-term flexibility as our costs increase that we stay in the, in the regulation process and we don't have to go back to the legislature. That was one of the, the main concerns they had going through this last process was, we just did one in 2018, it became effective. 2019, why are you back here? And looking back at how we got there, it was when the analysis was do done in 2013, or 2017, it said our cost at that period of time. And unfortunately, they were set at that 2017 rate. And as everyone knows, costs have increased exponentially since then, so there was no accounting for future growth. This bill, for the most part, gives us that by giving us so much flexibility in increasing the annual license renewal fee, we can keep up over time and we have a lot, lot more long-term before we're gonna have to go back to the legislature and make any more requests. Excellent, thank you. Ms. Walker, do you see um, from your uh, viewpoint any major red flags with the bill? Um, I don't. Um, we, we do have the, we have the concerns from the providers about the cost of the courses, but there's, 
there's um, at the CE committee level, there's been discussion of process improvements that could fix that fee. There's also under the current process, we renew, they, they have to resubmit every single year for one year of approval. So there's, there's efficiencies and kind of ideas to be gained there, but I think the structure itself is sound. Um, it's, it's, a, it's better than what we had. Um, I'm very supportive of having the, the flexibility for increasing the primary cost driver, um, but I, I don't have any specific concerns with the bill. I have a just a minor question. You you mentioned about um, the dire directory and the notification of change of address, contact information. You said the word immediately, and I'm wondering what that means. Um, so this is going to drive us to have to do some regulations to probably define what that means. Um, it's right now we have regulations. We have um, especially 303 where it requires that you provide um, you file your address with the board, and it, it specifies the time frame. I think it's 30 days um, that you have to make that change. What we're looking at through that bill is ideally doing a section 100, which is a, a much simpler regulation package to just update our regulations to reflect what's in that bill, um, assuming it passes. So that way it's, we've got it enforceable at that point. And then we're also working with um, the department to make sure that we have what's necessary on the IT side to capture email addresses within our um, one of our systems. The connect system is fine, but our other system is going to need some enhancement. So I'm hearing uh, likely 30 days is what immediately. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. It, it's um, as far as you'd be looking, probably around 30 days. Um, the thing with um, the connect, the idea behind it is the connect system lets everyone update their contact information in real time. So while we would set a reasonable time frame, probably about 30 days for making that notification. We're also trying to make sure it's ease of access, so it's not a very difficult process to inform the board when, when you move or if you get new contact information. Thank you. Any other comment from the board members? Hearing none. Moderator, can we please open for public comment, agenda item number 10. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, thank you. Moving to agenda item number 11, discussion and possible action to address licensees repeating continuing education courses, CCR title 16, section 361 to 366. Um, what we what we need to do here, the purpose for this item is that we need to um, discuss whether changes to the continuing education regulations are necessary to address those licensees um, that are earning credit for repeating continuing education courses. And uh, today we're asked to uh, discuss the topic, consider a motion to either develop a regulatory proposal um, to specifically address this issue or refer the matter to the CE committee for inclusion in the comprehensive updates. And I'd, I'd like to um, turn it over to um, Ms. Van Allen to kind of give us an overview in, of, of what we're seeing here at, at the staff level. Thank you, Dr. Paris. Um, so when the regulations that are currently in place were written, um, the idea of allowing um, chiropractors to take a course multiple times, um, the idea was that if you take a course multiple times, you may glean a little more information each time that you take it. But um, 
long term, what we're seeing, um, especially in our restoration applications for people who have um, either let their license go into forfeiture or become canceled, is we are seeing them take the same two, three courses over and over and over and over again and submitting it all in their restoration package to, um, to meet the, uh, the annual CE requirements. And, um, and you're also noticing it in your petitioner packages. And so I think for some chiropractors, this, um, that allowance is kind of giving them just authority or the ability to just skate through the CE, um, you know, if they have to do five years worth of CE, taking the same two courses, you know, to complete all of that CE, I don't know how much more you can really glean the fifth, sixth, seventh time you take it in a matter of a few days. <laughs> um, but that is a pattern that we are seeing more often, especially in the restoration applications and as well with the um, petitioner packages that you're receiving. Um, so I think you would need to consider um, CE, you know, per year if, if you're going to allow them to take a course more than once per their annual year. But separately, you would need to consider for um, people whose license are in forfeiture or canceled, as well as your petitioners, you know, if there's a time frame if you're going to allow them to take a course more than once, if you're going to set parameters between when they can do that again, you know, say once every three years, if they've been, you know, revoked for a very long time and they have a ton of CE to do, um, I think you need to consider this issue in um, both circumstances. Do you have any questions about it? I, I have a quick question. Can you give us a sense of um, how often we're seeing this in the licensee 24-hour renewals? In just a basic annual renewal where they're keeping up on their seat. Yeah, not a petitioner. Yeah, um, I would say oof, it's pretty common. Um, We haven't been doing audits, but you would see that they've continued those same courses over the years. I, I would say it could be as high as maybe 30%, 25%. That's pretty high. And are you referring 30% to um, the same course in the same renewal period or the same course perhaps over like a three, five year renewal period? Maybe they've taken it a few times. Um, I would say where they're repeating you know, they're taking the course this year and then they're taking it again next year. So it's over multiple renewal periods. Um, so when we do CE audits and then if we go back further, we do see where they just continually take that same course every year. And staff can identify this by the um, approval number would stay the same on a renewal from year to year? The approval number does change, uh -huh. but you can see the provider is the same, the heading of the course is the same, and um, um, the hours are the same. So in, and sometimes we do pull the applications to actually look at them, you know, if there are questions, and we can verify that it's the exact same course. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion that we um, move this into the CE committee and have a more, um, you know, focused discussion and incorporate this into the to the regulations because I think it's obviously it's a problem when we look at the petitioner packets, but I think it's also. And I, you know, I mean, I'm I'm one of those that likes to take courses, you know, a few times, but not typically back to back to back to back to back every year. So, um, and I think that's the concern. So my motion would be that we, you know, move this to the and include it into our comprehensive discussion as we're finishing up CE in in the committee aspect. I do have a question. Is there a way to get um, more specific metrics on? what you're discussing as far as the percentage of what we're seeing as far as those repeat classes or is 
that's uh, not available. Unfortunately, it's not easily or readily available. Yeah. Okay. Um, the auditing is a completely manual process, okay. and we haven't done audits for several years because of the um, extensions that were granted during COVID. Um, but so what I'm seeing now more so is the um, in the restoration applications and then you're seeing in your petitioner packets. But once we get to auditing again, we can definitely start kind of keeping metrics and, um, and provide updates on this. Okay, thank you. Well, along the same lines to follow up with that, my understanding is with Connect, as we move forward, our objective is, is that certificates will be uploaded immediately so that you will be able to just click on a licensee and see their certificates right there. So it should be in the going forward be a lot easier to audit that, correct? That's correct. Uh, Connect currently uses, uh, contains the functionality for the licensee themselves to upload their records and attach, which, where it still becomes a little manual because you have to check each one to make sure it's entered correctly. But the goal with implementing the, um, the provider access is that we would mandate that they go in and upload their records from each of their courses and then have it sync with the licensee's records. Then we not only have the exact data, but we know it's reliable because it came directly from the provider. Ms. Walker, can you um, tell us what we're currently experiencing with that, though? Um, and because I think we still take those manually, the uploading the CE and sending in the the forms. Are we seeing any hesitation to do it online? So that's what we're we're experiencing within the Connect system, a pretty low utilization rate of the system, and we think a lot of that's driven by the fact that the way the license renewal process was developed in that system, in addition to answering the questions that are answered about discipline and convictions within that renewal period, um, it includes an area where they're uploading each of their course records in real time and then submitting the application. So while we have the information up front, there's a lot of hesitancy from the licensee perspective, either you want to renew earlier and you haven't even completed all of the CE yet, but you want to get your payment in, you can't use that system, or also it's a little bit burdensome to do that versus the audit system that they're primarily used to. So what we're working to develop is to remove that from the application process and more closely mirror the paper process where you're just answering the questions and submitting the payment. And then long-term, we would then have in the background an area for you to maintain your continuing education records and you would see what the providers are eventually uploading and integrate. It's gonna show that it was submitted directly from there and then give you the ability if you took something outside of board approved CE, you can upload it yourself. So we'll have visibility to what they're doing, um, but outside of the renewal process so that we can get um, better data and, and less manual intervention of us having to click and review manually PDFs. Yeah, I think we want to incentivize um, licensees to the efficiencies that we're creating. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you. It sounds like there's action items on that and it's being worked on currently. It is, yeah. I've, we've brought the concerns to the department's attention with the way it was originally developed and they've got quite a few resources from OAS developing and working on that process. Thank you. Oh, question. And just to clarify, on the uh, kind of CE provider side within the system, this, uh, what's it called? Mm -hmm. Each upload would be able to be connected directly to that respective CE provider, so it's not like it's just a floating upload of um, a certificate, but it's actually directly connected so we can provide, uh, connect, collect stats on how many courses that were specific providers are providing, are conducting. Yeah, it's going to, it's going to unlock just a, just a plethora of data that we can use because it's going to connect with each of the providers. We're going to have information on their courses, how many people attended those courses. I mean, it's just, it's going to give us unlimited data for us to come through and um, develop reports around. Thank you. And just for your information, if the committee eventually does recommend some changes, a lot of my healthcare boards do have a regulation stating per each renewal cycle, uh, only one course can be taken. Uh, you cannot repeat a course. So that's um, already being done with a lot of healthcare boards for the renewal cycle. So if eventually where you go, you're not alone. And I'll second Dr. Adams' uh, motion. Thank you. Any discussion amongst the board? 
I would I would ask um, if perhaps you might accept a friendly amendment. Um, the in our packet there was uh, there were questions the four questions that staff had submitted that we might um, consider and I, I think they they all are important and they all um, are. are the points that we, I think, the committee would really need to focus on. So, I would, I would ask maybe that um, that the committee specifically have these as discussion um, talking points at their meetings. So amended. Thank you. you want me to restate it, please. I move that we. Uh, Take this agenda item and its uh, contents, including the four questions posed by staff for consideration to the uh, committee meeting as part of our comprehensive revision of the regulations in CE. Thank you. Do we still have a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, moderator, can you please open uh, this agenda item number 11 for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, uh, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, thank you. Mr. Sweet, would you please call for the vote? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Raphael Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number 12, discussion and possible action on the frequency and scheduling of board meetings. Um, what we need to discuss here today is just uh, essentially whether we need changes to the frequency and process of scheduling our meetings um, and also uh, to see if we can come up with a tentative 2023 meeting schedule in advance and if there's any preferences for in-person teleconference uh, or hybrid, et cetera. So I'll open it up to the floor. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I think a hybrid model would be great. It, one, would save money as far as the continual travel. I do think in-person helps to uh, foster more of a conversation uh, so I think a hybrid would be great. Um, I think uh, some of our one-day meetings, while it's less time, I, I do feel that we may need some two-day meetings. Um, I prefer to have it scheduled out on my schedule to avoid these sort of emergency uh, board meetings, which are extremely disruptive. Um, so I'm happy to commit the time if we need it so that we can move you know, packages and regulations uh, forward you know, I feel if we're, we're going to do it, let's just, you know, put in the time and make it efficient and get it done. So I'm sort of of the mind of a hybrid, you know, scheduling them out. If we need a day and a half or two days, let's just plan on that. And so we avoid these sort of emergency uh, meetings. So those are kind of some of my thoughts. Thank you. One of the suggestions we'd had previously, just to refresh everyone's memory, was that we we realized that the um, sometimes the the unpredictable, the more unpredictable um, agenda items tend to be the petitioners, and so we had suggested that if we were going to do a two day meeting or a one and a half day meeting, that we would do um, perhaps do the petitioners on the um, the night before the afternoon leading into the next day. 
um, business meeting, and I, I, I'm I'm fond of I'm fond of that idea. If we need to do a one and a half day meeting, I I think that structure um, would serve us well, and it would it would give us assurances that um, that there's no need or um, uh, that we're we're giving the petitioners um, every single minute and all the time that they need to get through um, their business with us. So. I agree. I, I mean, I feel like if we run over with the half day, it's costing the board uh, more money for the attorney's time. Um, and if we need the time, let's just plan it. And you, if we're paying for the full day, that's, you know, I think putting the petitioners is a different feel than the regular uh, board meeting material. Yeah. Uh. Ms. Walker, what, what would you anticipate our frequency of uh, greater than one day meetings? What would you anticipate that need to be? Well, uh, Dr. Daniels makes a good point with what we're charged by the Office of Administrative Hearings. When we exceed a half a day, we end up paying for the whole day. So there's a couple strategies we could do. When we're planning out for the year, it's helpful if we set the quarterly board meetings and it's not a bad idea to just plan for two and then as we get closer, we can adjust. Um, but the other option would be of the quarterly meetings, if you identify two of the meeting dates that are going to be a full two days in person, we can plan for day one to just be an entire day of petition hearings. So you'll hear more petitions, Makes sense. but you're already paying for it versus maybe hearing petitions at each and every meeting. Maybe you do two in-person meetings a year via a hybrid model where we're here, but we've got a remote connection available, and then maybe two where they're exclusively WebEx. and you can participate remotely from other locations. And that would also depend on how many petitioner hearings we have, correct? Correct, yeah. And we current, we've we been kind of, we've been keeping up with what we receive, but we do receive a pretty significant volume of petitioners um, or petition packets. It's going to remain to be seen under um, our current fee structure. Their, um, their proposal is to increase that cost to about $3,000 to petition before the board. So it could have a cooling effect. It will just kind of remain to be seen how many petitions we start receiving next calendar year compared to now. But right now we have a pretty steady flow um, and we do have a waiting list of people that would like to be heard before the board. And is that your recommendation? Would that be your recommendation? My recommendation would be to identify two in-person meeting dates, one in Northern California and one in Southern California, and then identify two meetings, likely through teleconference, all day meetings, that would be a single day. I concur. I, I do as well. One, one other question for me. Uh, the, the petitioners, what, what, can you give a guesstimate of what, what we're looking at, the backlog of petitioners? Val, do you? Um, six people right now. So is that, is it, and since this is our second meeting of this year, we're probably not going to have another in-person meeting until probably next year. I mean, are, are you suggesting that we do a, a petitioner before the end of the year, WebEx or, or in-person? Um, I should have clarified. So with that recommendation, I was really talking, looking at 2023. Um, when we have six petitioners in the queue, that at the pace and that we've been going at, that's going to take us two meetings just to catch up. And we know that within that time frame, we'll likely get more petitions. So that's how we kind of have been steadily maintaining that backlog or waiting list, if you will. Um, looking at the October meeting, we have some flexibility under the different provisions. So if the board would like to do it, remotely via teleconference and we focus on regular business as we're going to be having all the committee meetings between now and October, it's probably a good idea. And then resume petition hearings at the January meeting, maybe make that a two day in person meeting and have a whole day of petitions and then um, regular business would be my recommendation. Or we may need to look at making October a two day meeting if we're trying to tackle petitions at the same time because it's the agenda at that October meeting is going to be a lot more substantial than what we're seeing for regular business here today. Meaning this October? This October, yes. Yeah. So in light of the fact that the fees are going up, is it likely that we're going to see a, 
a lot of people getting their applications in for reconsideration or reinstatement before the end of the year, which so that they're in the queue. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that. I would expect to see a significant number of people, especially as we're getting the word out about the fee increase, that we're going to probably get a substantial number in December trying to get it in before that deadline with the fee increase. So, so it would be advantageous to probably get some of those knocked out in October and like spend a full day, maybe just a full day of petitioner hearings and then another day for business? Correct, yeah, if, if calendars permit and the board's available to have the October meeting be a two-day meeting, we could do that. Um, we, we are gonna need a full day to get through um, the regular business because we're gonna have reports coming out of each of the committees um, at that meeting. Can you refresh my memory? What is the date? It's October 27th. 27th, oh, okay. I believe it's on a Thursday and I have a commitment already on the 28th. Um, I could do the, you know, the day before the 26th. Okay. Is, can everyone else look at the, um, the 26th? That, that's a, looks like that's a Wednesday. So it would give us a Wednesday. It sounds like at a minimum we'd need a half day there. I mean, if, if scheduling doesn't permit full days for a quorum. Right. Yeah, we, we have some options. So if we're if we're gonna go with petitioners in October, if we make it a rem, a remote meeting where you're not traveling, then you're not going to be dedicating having to dedicate that time to getting to the location sure. um so it may be maybe working better for everyone's schedule if they do it that way um but to do petitioners you need a minimum of a half day and it would likely need to be on another day because we're not going to have enough um, time on the 27th to do regular business um and all the committee stuff my my suggestion was going to be that if 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 everyone can do a full day on the 26th, great. Let's let's agree to it and schedule it. Um, but if there's uh, any issues there, that at minimum we try and do a half day on the 26th. I can do a full day, the 26th, 27th. Works. Is that in person? Are we talking about in person for the 26th or 27th? Virtual. Correct. Either. That's that's another decision that would be helpful if the board made here because we, we could set it up either way. It's really up to the board and what the preferences are. I, I would recommend with the um, relative short notice on the change to the dates that it would be a hybrid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's doable. Can I do that? <laughs> would. Yes. Yeah. When you say hybrid, are you meaning some people that can be here be here, yeah. some people via WebEx? Yes. Should you choose to sit in this room, you're always welcome to, if the, you know, here and then WebEx if not. So switching it from the 20, from the 28th that we used to have, we were going to have it on what, the 27th? We, we, we did not have the 28th scheduled. It was, um, was going to be was Thursday. One day. Yeah. Was, we would add the 26th Wednesday. Okay. If everybody could do a full day, then. Um, and you're going to let us know whether you're going to do a half or a full on that day? It just depends on the, the board's availability here. If there's availability for a full day as well on the 26th, we'll, go, we'll move forward with scheduling more than the three petitioners so that potentially closer to five could probably be heard. We can get that backlog. We need to do a full day if we can. Yeah. I mean, we have enough. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll make that happen. I'll make that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, we don't need a mode. We don't. And I don't need to decide right now whether I can be here for in person or virtually. I can just, we can leave it open, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. The benefit of that, the uh, provisions under SB 189 is it provides flexibility. So like we have today, we have a physical, physical location here, but if any board member had something occur that they couldn't be here in person, you also could have participated from a remote location with no problem. So I, yeah, I can make that happen. It's, can anyone not make that work? You can make it, everyone's good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Um, 
there we go. <laughs> that, that was kind of easy. Should we? Thank you for that. Should we get something for? Are you suggesting January to do another petitioner, or since we're doing them in August, rather than pushing to 2023, that 21 can just be a one-day meeting? Yeah, in light of in light of making October the two-day meeting, my recommendation would be for the January and potentially the July meetings to be remote and then plan to do a two-day in-person meeting in April and October of 2023. Should we look at April right now or look at those dates? It would be helpful if, and we certainly have the time this morning, if the board could go through um, calendars in January, April, July, and October of next year and identify some good dates that work. Um, then we can get those dates fixed and then we'll go back with the committee chairs and work on a scheduling um, committee meetings within each of those time frames. So we'll do the schedule the regular board meetings and then we'll move on to the committee meetings and getting those on the books as well. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we also need to schedule the committee meetings for this year. Yeah, here today, if we could schedule committee meetings just between now and October, right. and then we'll take offline the scheduling for 2023, we can work directly with the chairs and the members of the committees. But if, if we can identify some dates that work right. um, coming up, well, let's get those on the calendar. So I would, I would only note the, um, in January the 16th, that Monday is a holiday weekend. Um, and then the second is the holiday for New Year's. So I don't think anyone wants to do it that early, but so I'm open to suggestions. Anyone have any suggestions on, uh, Ms. Walker, is it better if we're later in the month or mid month? Is there any preference there? Or can we just throw some dates out? Are we talking about committees or are we talking about the January meeting? January. The January board meeting. meeting. Yeah. We're going to see if we can get the um, the full board meetings uh, yes. tentatively calendared. And then uh, I think the committee meetings you'll take, we'll do that. We'll try to do the October. Later one. through staff. Yes. Um, so we'll do 2023 board meeting dates now. And then after those have been settled, we'll go back to the discussion on um, committee meetings between just now and our October meeting, and then we'll take the rest of the committee meeting scheduling offline with the chairs. And maybe a brief discussion on just um, kind of how everyone feels about those ongoing, like regularity and... Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh, and in response to your question about the January, um, their preference would be um, mid to late January rather than just right on the cusp of the holiday season. I'm open in January, so. I'd, I'd propose um, the 26th or 27th. That works for me. I'm not available then. If I'm the only one, then obviously you can. I'll give you the point. 26, 27. Are we, I thought we were doing a one day in January and a two day in April. Correct. Yeah, we just need one day in January. I was just picking one, yeah. either one of those, but if yeah. those don't work for doctors. Is the 19th or 20th, is that work for it works. everybody as well? Either yeah. one I can do. 20th might be better, but I'm flexible. Sure. 20th, January? That's a Friday. Friday, January 20th. Any objections there? Yeah, that, that should work for me. Okay. Are we, going, are we going also going to try to flip between Fridays, Thursdays, like we've done in the past? Yeah, I'm open. Well, yeah, so, the, so that would mean potentially the Thursday single day would be in July because April would be tentatively two-day. So should we move to April and schedule a two-day? Yes. Okay. Thank you. April 13, 14, or 2021? Mm -hmm. 2021 would be better for me, but I can make the other work. So 
What was what was the date again? Sorry. I'm hearing generally Thursday Fridays are those are our, is everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. Or are we okay? Okay. Um, I'm good with the 2021. Is, are the other board members good with 2021 April? Mm -hmm. and this one, the April one is in person, we're saying, correct? Yes, yeah. Would we decide um, Northern California, Southern California also right now? Not a bad idea to just yeah. identify that as well. Um, we've been in Northern California all year, so it, it might make sense to make the April meeting in Southern California. Yeah, I would agree. Any comment, objection to that? What was that? Um, we have to also decide yeah. Northern California and Southern California. And, uh, it was noted we've been in Northern California all year, so maybe Southern California in April. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go ahead and get July 2023? Yeah, let's do it. We're on a roll. I'm available the 7th, the 21st, if we're doing Friday or the 28th. It would be, we'd do a Thursday this time. Oh, okay. To flip back. Okay. Is, is there a preference um, early month, late month? Um, staff? No, we've got, we've got good spacing with what we have here. So any, anything in July would work for staff. Other than obviously the fourth is a holiday, so not the third either. Okay. July twentieth. So July twentieth, yeah. I can do that. Any objection to uh, Thursday, July twentieth, for the July board meeting? And that's that's uh, considered hybrid or virtual. Yes. Okay. But uh, oh, it's before. Is it after the? After the bill expires, so, yeah, those pro the current provisions will be expired. Um, so it just it we still, ah. ideally we can still conduct it through WebEx. It's just we may potentially need to notify or notice your teleconference locations, like we did um, for the May meeting. Right, or there might be no, new legislation in place by then. Sure. Thank you for that. And then the next one is October, a two-day? October two-day. Of 2023 now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Monday the 9th is a federal holiday. Looks like it's Columbus Day. So 19th and 20th. I can do that. Yep. And we would be back here, correct? Correct. Northern California. So we can either do Sacramento or in the Bay Area even. And I know at one point, we should also maybe discuss this. At one point we were, and part of, I think, um, was discussed in our strategic planning yesterday was that um, we were trying to get back into having meetings at the colleges. Yes. Um, so, I know like consideration for both Southern California and Northern California. I'm I'm sure Life West or Palmer West would host us. Yeah. Yeah, I I would agree with that. We've had quite a few meetings lately at um, DCA, and we can we can expand out a little bit. And um, assuming there's no change in legislation as far as logistics and what we have to provide at a meeting, um, and assuming the venue can meet those needs. Um, I think it'd be a good idea to maybe consider trying to reach out to Palmer for that meeting, um, just in light of it closing and then get Life West um, at the next go around that we're in the area. On the calendar. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would, I think it's really supportive of, of the idea that we get out of DCA is that our attendance seems to be much, our in-person attendance is higher, it feels like when we're at the chiropractic colleges. Yeah, you get the students, it's more engaged, yeah. so I, I agree. It's an education opportunity. Everyone's okay with the 19th, 20th? October 19th, 20th, that Thursday okay. and Friday. Yes. 
Okay. Do we need any motion on this agenda item? Okay. And so are we circling back now to this year committee meeting? Yes. Yeah. If we could, um, while we're all looking at calendars, if we can identify some dates for each of the now four committees to meet but in September um, or early October, we can stagger them a little bit. Dr. Paris, could you, um, before we schedule that, do a little clarification on the four committees and the members? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you, do you have the last list? I'm scrolling into it right now. Um, Can we put it up on, is there a way to get it up on the screen? Um, no. Not not easily because we don't have um, okay. a document ready that the... Um, we'll read it aloud. Yeah. And will the committee meetings be high, uh, virtual or hybrid? I would recommend solely WebEx okay. for the committee meetings. I don't think it's necessary to have yeah. an in-person location. I just want to know what to put in my notes when I yeah. <laughs> add it to the schedule. As far as, as, far as the committee um, membership, we have our government and public affairs committee with chair Ms. Cruz and then uh, member Mr. Sweet. Our enforcement and scope of practice committee is chaired by Dr. Adams with members, Mr. Sweet and Dr. Paris. And then we had formerly had the licensing and continuing education committee and that one pulling the current. My recollection of the C is Dr. Paris is the chair, myself and Dr. Daniels. That's correct. I'm trying to, where I overlooked the licensing. And the licensing. I think, I think you're the chair of the licensing, my recollection. Yeah. And I think I'm on it. Yes. <laughs> the second committee that was listed? Sweet. CE, enforcement, licensing, and government affairs, which you're the chair. Oh, CE enforcement, that's what I was thinking. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's um, myself, mm -hmm. Dr. Paris, and Raphael. Mm -hmm. So I think prior, before we discuss actually scheduling these, um, one of the one of the um, discussions that we had had earlier and one of the issues that we seem to run into is the um, open-ended, you know, kind of meeting scheduling and it seemed to work better for our board members when we were able to time limit those meetings versus, you know, having the um, until the end of business um, type of phrasing in there. So uh, generally my experience has been that uh, you can take these in two hour chunks and, but I don't know if there's any discussion around that, um, so I'll open it up to the floor. Just quick before it goes to the discussion, it's more a question for Sabina. So when we notice the meetings, we set a time, but then we always generically put until completion of business, and that's just to give us flexibility if the meeting is extremely short and someone logs in late, it could have already concluded, or if we have to go over, we have the flexibility. That, that is correct. Some of my other boards who have smaller committees like to um, hold them all in one day and kind of stagger them. Maybe they would start at nine until completion of business, but they might have a beginning time for the one that comes right after, because that way you can have a little break, especially if you're on more than one committee. Um, and you can kind of bang them out like that in a day or over a two-day period. Um, but it's always good just at least to have your um, starting time, I, I don't want you to limit your discussion and think you have to get offline by a certain time because that wouldn't be prudent for your business. Um, but a lot of these, like you said in the past, 
um, they're typically going to be two hours or less regardless. Or, you know, you can ask the staff to make sure your agenda is such that they feel it can be done in two hours or less. Yeah, my only concern with that is, you know, as I'm trying to schedule them, I, you know, I don't want to limit the conversation at the same time. I do need to provide care to my patients. And so I do need to let my staff know when, uh, you know, a start time and end time. So, you know, if it's that we plan, you know, it, say it's two hours, but, you know, no more than three, then I can, you know, kind of work around that. So I don't, I don't know how the other members feel. I mean, if we get to the time frame that we propose and there's still discussion and business, we can can we just move that to the next meeting? Absolutely. You can you can call it a day on there. You can direct you know you can always can direct staff, hey, you know, this is a great discussion. Can you take what we've heard so far, bring it back to the next uh, you know, work up whatever we've already talked about, bring it back to the next committee meeting. Um, you know, if one person leaving loses the quorum, then obviously our, our meeting will have to end. But um, you can always table discussion items. My preference would be to um, not necessarily have any vague vagary in the in the how how long we plan for that meeting and and know that we can continue that discussion or the business item if needed. Um, I know in my case. Particularly, it's it's also very difficult. And if I were to say two-ish to th you know two to three hours, uh, it might as well be three. And just let's make a hard stop and get you know everything we need done. So um, that would that would just be my preference. Yeah, I think that's the best way to do. It. If you're if it's three, just make it three and hard stop. Yeah, and I think that prompts uh, efficient discussion as well versus. If we have all day, potentially, then people can drag things out longer, potentially, than needs to be. So that's my preference as well. And we can have staff potentially give us a recommendation as to whether um, the volume of agenda items might necessitate a three hour versus a two hour. And yeah, I'm, and notice I'm, that. I'm hearing the preference for two, and I think that's I think that's efficient and a good way to to have the discussion, but um, still get work done. I just would caution. Well, you may see in the agenda with us saying your meeting is from two to four or until completion of business, don't feel like, and we'll communicate with the chair, don't feel like that means that you're stuck on that call until we sort that issue out. There is the option to certainly, if you have a hard stop at four, table it for a future meeting and we'll take it from there. And I would suggest going into the meetings, if you know you have a certain time you have to leave, go ahead and let staff know in the background so it's not disruptive to the meeting and just, hey, FYI, you know, 12.30 is my hard stop for sure. I'll try to put it on my phone and be there when we're driving to get a few more minutes or something so that the discussion can keep going and you don't have to take up the meeting time with letting everybody know what's going on. And that way it's a little seamless. I, I personally love the idea of the two hours because I can do that right in the middle of my day and, you know, bookend, you know, half hour stop with patients and then start back. And and I feel like, you know, if we're coming in there ready to go and, and the, like we've talked about yesterday, that the staff is, here's what we need to do, here's what the discussion needs to be focused on, and we come in prepared, then I think we can get a lot done in a short time and we can meet more frequently without it, you know, messing up our schedules as practitioners. Yeah, I agree of having more efficient meetings so that we can have the flexibility to meet more frequently so that we can move some of this forward instead of having the undetermined lengthy meetings. Uh, so with that in mind, um, let's, I, should we just start with committees and go down the line and see if we can agree to a date, date and time? Correct. Yeah, I'd be looking at the window of probably late September, very early October, and if we could just go committee by committee and just set dates, and then staff, we have our target, and we'll get, get the materials ready and off to the committee members. And I'm guessing a second half of the month is preference for, for staff, or I'm not sure how, if it's different with the committee meetings versus the board meetings. We're, um, we're very flexible in terms of um, timeframes between 
um, when we scheduled those meetings, we're very open for committee meetings. When we're looking at 2023, um, just staff is very flexible. Um, just in looking at scheduling between now and October, we need flexibility so that we can get the agenda and the materials all ready. Um, and then we need um, time, we need a gap between the committee meeting and the board meeting so we can formally notice it appropriately and get the materials ready. So that's why um, late September and very early October are good windows or even into the second week of October, just not encroaching on the 10-day notice requirement under Bagley Keene. Um, I'll lead, I'll start. <laughs> uh, Dr. Daniels and Adams, would you be available um, either on September 29th, Thursday, or September 30th for a two-hour window for a CE meeting? Uh, I'm already kind of booked September, October, but I can make Friday, September 30th work. Two hours. This would be uh -huh. committee meeting, yeah. okay? Uh, Dr. Adams? No, unfortunately, I'm I'm in uh, Asheville, North Carolina for a conference, so it's going to be hard for me to step out. Um, on that Friday. How about? But, but but you two, you know, would we can make a quorum? Would make a quorum. What about like Monday, the October third, or? Sure. Yeah. I, or that next week. Yeah, I'll I'll just be getting back. So I mean, I certainly could do. I mean. I mean that would be tough just getting back that Monday after being gone to 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 to, to put that two hour window. What about uh, Thursday, October sixth, sort of in the midday as a lunch break? I don't know if that works with your works patient, for me. patient schedule. Like a twelve to two. Yeah, I could just move a couple people, and that I don't know if that works for Dr. Adams. Yeah, I think a Thursday, October sixth. Out of twelve to two, okay. I mean, Thursdays are generally better for me because I'm I'm not actively seeing patients. And twelve to two is yeah, that's not a bad time. One of my busier days, but I can cut yeah. that out for yeah. sure. Okay. okay, so October six, twelve to two, and this is CE. Yes. Thank you both. And does much. that work for for you all? Yeah, the, the staff is, we're open um, except for, it's just, there's a, um, we have a conflict um, beginning on September 20th and likely going through the end of that week. So, uh, so October 6th, you're looking for a 12 to 2? Okay. October 6th, 12 to 2, yep. CE. Done. Yep. Done. Right. Okay. All right, next. And <laughs> Jump in. All right. Uh, how about you and I? For um, so the licensing. Yeah. Okay. What's it called? Um, my preference would be. Uh, I'm. Could you do Mondays or no? I can do Monday. What's it called? Uh, Nine twenty-six or ten ten. I. Uh, I can do uh, nine twenty-six if it was kind of later morning. Oh no, that's completely fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you just want to do 926, like a 12 to 2 again? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I know. I'm, uh, what's it called? Those are my days off. Okay. So I'm, I'm open those days after 10 o'clock. Okay. So licensing committee with myself and Jeanette, 926, 12 to 2. Does that work with uh, staff? I'm actually in another board meeting that oh, day. Oh, okay. Just kidding. Kidding. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Uh, I have every Monday in September, I think, booked with board meetings. Uh, what about in October, Monday, oh. uh, the 10th? Yes, yeah. that one also. That one you're free or you're not no, free? I'm, I have a board meeting that day. I have a board meeting Friday the 14th. And I, can, I can do any other day. I can work around. Those are just my. And, okay. And are you, I have a board meeting Monday, October 3rd? I do not. Does that one work for you? I can make it work. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. 
I can, I can switch, switch it around. Okay. So Monday, October 3rd, 12 to 2 for licensing. Does that work? Yeah, that'll work for staff. Okay. Not for us. Uh, and then uh, I called Mr. Sweet, you and I, uh, for governance. Uh, any specific dates, preferences for you on your side? We're still looking at late October? Uh, um, second half September, first half October, first half October. We do that second week of October, like 10th or through 14th. Any of those dates work? What'd you say? Any of those dates, the 10th through the 14th of October? Under uh, what's it called? Um, what's it called? I think we established uh, the 10th couldn't work because uh, the, uh, I oh. think we're gonna have a she can't make it. So I yeah. can't do any of those other dates. Yeah, I can't. I can. I can't do the 10th, 12th, or 14th on that week. You said 10, 12, or 14. So Monday I cannot. Yeah. yeah. So so Tuesday, Thursday only. So, on that week, correct. Yeah. So that week, 11th to 13. So and the week before, the fourth works. I can do the fourth. Yep, I can do the fourth. What, what time? Uh, I'm, I'm flexible. Uh, with about late morning, early afternoon, so 11 to 1 or 12 to 2? 11 to 1 would be good. Okay. Yeah, 10-4, 11 to 1. This is governance, correct? Mm -hmm. Oh, one more. Just in the CE enforcement. Okay, so I'm looking on here enforcement. So that's uh, myself. Dr. Paris and Raphael. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Paris, if on the heels of the CE, is that too much for you? That be the sixth. Yeah, keeping it on the on the same day. Um, and try and go like two to four. Yeah, like when like when we end CE, you know, maybe like two fifteen to four fifteen. They'll give us a little. Sure. Yeah, I'll do whatever works Does for you. Does that work for you? Yeah, I'll make two. it work. So I'm just thinking the same day yeah, we're there. The day. You know, then down. that 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 way we're October sixth. Yeah, we're yeah. dialed in. Yeah. Okay. I'll just call it two to four for now. Is that okay? Do we need to continue on or is that enough for now and we can work on scheduling some of these offline outside of the, are we, I mean, we, we have all the committee meetings between now and October. Yeah, that, um, that sets what we need. If we want to go just, well, I, it depends how far you want to go with this, but um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to then schedule maybe between October and January and then table the rest for um, the committee chair to work on. Um, further into 2023, but we we do have um, a significant number of items that need to go before the October meeting and likely there'll be follow-up discussion that'll feed into um, November, December, or even early January before um, the next board meeting early next year. Um, so tell me again, what's your suggestion? Um, doing another round of scheduling committee meetings, um, likely, with the holiday season, we're probably looking at um, very early January. Okay. Schedule, scheduling additional committee meetings right 
right then? Correct, because that... Um, two weeks before, like two weeks before that? But, yeah, two weeks before the... Um, so actually it's going to be the first, either the first week of January or maybe the second week of December, because ahead of the holiday season, either before or immediately following. Oh. It, the issue with that is then uh, we won't be able to have any specific recommendations from the committee for the board, full board to, to consider. They can obviously hear updates and reports, but any specific action items, um, because we would have to have the agenda out and published by the 10th, and if we have committee meetings occurring in that interim, we wouldn't be able to include any recommendations. You can still hold your meetings, of course, just so you know that. It would have to be them. before the 10th? Yeah. Is that the committee meeting yeah. would be? So okay. So gotcha. her suggestion of doing gotcha. it in December makes sense. Right, because you need enough time to put any recommendation and action items on your agenda. So we Coming could do out of like the first or the second of December, and that would give us enough time? It, it, um, any, any, time in December. any time in December, because our oh, meeting's not till later. It has, to, it has to, to be at least 10 days mm -hmm. before. Okay. I'm open to, to uh, Dr. Daniel, Dr. Adams, whatever you guys, if you have a, a date, either December mid December or, or 9th is perfect. Any of those? Yeah. Okay. And Dr. Adams? Uh, let's see. Um, we're talking about a two hour, right? Middle two of the day, hour. like a yeah. twelve thirty, two thirty, or twelve sure. to two type thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can. I think. Uh, can we do the second? On I that might one? be leaning more towards. Uh, more towards the second. Okay. Twelve thirty to two thirty. Yeah. That's great for me. Whatever. Okay. Whatever. Right. Doctor Adams, twelve thirty to two thirty. This is CE, right? Yes. And a 12, 12 to 2? Um, I think, yes. I think Dr. Daniels either, suggested 12.30 to Either one is fine and flexible. But, I mean, 12.30 to 2.30 works great for me. Yeah, that's fine. I prefer that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Let's do that then. Daniels, uh, yeah, Dr. Daniels, you said uh, the ninth is also a good day for you. Yes. Do you want to do? Yeah, let's do the ninth um, for the licensing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything that works? Anything that works for you. Uh, can we do ten to twelve? Yep. Okay. Sorry, could you repeat that? Please? Yeah. Uh, so it would be December ninth. Okay. Ten a.m. to twelve p.m. for licensing. Thank you. So then as for enforcement, I wouldn't be able to do it on the heels of that on that Friday the 9th. Well, I could do that. I guess technically I could. Oh, you're saying you could not? No, I'm saying, I, I mean, I, I just, you know, blocking it out, just. On the second? Oh, the 9th for enforcement? Uh, no, I'm sorry, the second, the, the same day. Dude. Um, oh, wait, I mean, I guess we could just do it the next Friday from 12.30 to 2.30. Is that work good for you? Or 2.30 to 4.30. Do what we did before and just have them. Well, on Fridays, it, you know, I'm going to see patients that day. So okay, no, I'll talk to you. If I do the 12.30 to 2.30 the following week on the 9th. Perfect. Then, you know, I was thinking on the second, you know, I could just come into the come in there late, but does that work for you on the 9th? 12.30 to 2.30 on the 12.30 to 2.30 yeah. on the 9th. And this uh, is enforcement, correct? Yep. And uh, actually, one more, Mr. Sweet, uh, for governance, uh, any preferences? Um, 
I mean, at this point, I'm still open those first couple of weeks of December. Yeah, can we do uh, Monday the 5th? Yeah. Well, what time? Um, let's do 11 to 1 again. Okay. All set. Is that all of them? That's everything. Thank you. This is very helpful. I don't know that we've ever scheduled 12 meetings at a meeting <laughs> like this, at least since I've been around. So thank you all very much um, for your flexibility and your time. And thank you. Um, we don't need a motion or anything here, I don't believe. Okay. Um, is everybody okay hanging in there for a few more minutes? We'll get through just a couple agenda items before we take a break. Okay. Um, so moving on to agenda item uh, number 13, public comment for items not on the agenda. Moderator, can you please open that agenda item number 13 up for public comment? This is a moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q and a feature for public comment members of the public. If you would like to make a comment for items, not on the agenda, uh, please click the Q and a icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your Webex screen or use the raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q and a panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please, thank you. Moving to agenda item number 14, future agenda items. I would open that up to the board. Any proposed future agenda items? Hearing none, moderator, can we please open agenda item 14 up for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your Webex screen. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Please, thank you. Okay, so what I would like to do is uh, request that we take a 10 minute break and um, then return into closed session and move agenda item number 17 up on the agenda. Any objections? 17A. A and B. Except for the petition. Right. And then we will return as planned, as scheduled, as planned at, at 1 o'clock after the lunch break for uh, petitioner hearings. Okay. Hearing no objections, we'll be on break for 10 minutes. We'll be back at 11. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to resume the Board of Chiropractic and the Board of Chiropractic Examiners Board meeting, August 19, 2022. The time is 1:03 p.m. We're going to move to agenda item 15, petition hearing for reinstatement of revoked license.
All right, uh, this is Judge Larson. I am not sure why my video is not working. <laughs> um, um, this is the moderator. Um, Judge Larson, do you have maybe like a cover over your webcam at all? I don't. Uh, let me just double check a few things. Hi, Judge Larson. Welcome. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, give me just a moment. I'm not sure why my, my camera's not working. There we go. Um, and it's also, well, we're just going to have to call it good with that. I just also want to confirm, uh, Dr. Paris, uh, we do not have a court reporter. It is my understanding that the, uh, the board is auto recording this through WebEx. Um, is that, is that correct? Yes, we are being recorded. Okay, so I don't, I don't need to worry about that then, correct? Uh, yes, All you right, are correct. Then. Thank you. All right, our first matter then is the Thomas Michael Classy matter. We are on the record. It's August 19th, 2022. Uh, 2022 is approximately 1.04 p.m. We are here in the matter of the petition for the reinstatement of re revoked license by Thomas Michael Classy. This matter is being heard before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California. This is OAH case number 2022-070524, board number AC2009-722. Will the board members please identify themselves for the record? Dr. David Paris, Chair. Dr. Lawrence Adams, Vice Chair. Raphael Sweet, Secretary. Jeanette Cruz. Dr. Pamela Daniels. All right, there is a quorum present. May I please um, uh, also take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General? Yes, good afternoon. Mabel Liu, Deputy Attorney General. Right, and I am Marcy Larson. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings presiding over the matter this afternoon. We are here at the daytime and location of the notice of hearing. Uh, Mr. Classy, are you with us also this afternoon? Yes. All right, so I can hear you, but I can't see you. Is that correct? Um, I guess, yeah. Uh, it's got my microphone is turned on. And oh, there, start video. Let's do that. There we go. There we go. All right, then I can see you now. All right, good Excuse afternoon. Me. Excuse me, Judge Larson. May I ask you a question? This is uh, Dr. Paris. Yes, of course. Um, I, I, I know Dr. Classy um, from a few years back. We uh, personally met and I was, I was planning on recusing um, from this matter. And so I'm wondering if I would do that right now or if I would um, do it before we went into public session? You would do that right now. Okay. Um, All right. Then I'm going to recuse myself. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for notifying me of that. All right. And, and uh, Dr. Classy, you are representing yourself today. Is that correct? Correct. Right. We were uh, supposed to have a court reporter this afternoon. One was not available. This matter is being audio recorded. Do you have any objection to that? No. All right, then we will proceed with the audio recording. Um, and you understand that you could have had an attorney represent you at your own expense? Yes. And you're choosing to proceed on your own behalf, is that correct? Yes. All right, so we are here this afternoon. This proceeding is concerning your petition for reinstatement of your license. In this proceeding, the board is primarily concerned with the rehabilitation that you've undertaken since the revocation of your license, since your license was disciplined. Ms. Liu, who's the Deputy Attorney General, will present first. She will present the petition package, which you should have, and she will mark, uh, have that marked for evidence. I will ask you if you have any objection to any of those documents in the petition package. And then Ms. Liu will give an orientation um, of the history of your licensure and history of discipline of your licensure. After that, well, you will have an opportunity to present your case. I will swear you in, and then you can pro provide the board any information that you want the board to consider for purposes of issuing a decision. 
After you've provided testimony, Ms. Lou will have an opportunity to question you. You may object to any questions she asks of you, but if uh, you have an objection, you have to tell me that you have an objection. Uh, you have, uh, must have a legal basis not to respond to a question, but if you have an objection, just please tell me. I'll find out why you're objecting, and I'll decide whether or not you have to answer the question. And after Ms. Liu is done questioning you, then I will ask the board members if they have any questions for you also. Each of the board mem members will have an opportunity to ask you questions if they wish. And then after the, uh, the board asks uh, you questions, I will ask you if there's anything in addition you would like to add. And then both yourself and Ms. Liu may give closing remarks to the board. Uh, at the end of the day today, the board will go into closed session and deliberate on, and, and on a decision. You will not receive a decision today. You will receive a decision in writing sometime in the future. During this proceeding, I cannot give any legal advice, but if you have any questions about the procedures, please ask me, and if I can answer the question, I will. Your any Honor, questions? can I ask a question? Yes. Okay, you said uh, the, this, the board will go into closed session and make a decision and that I will know at a future date. That's quite ambiguous. Can you, can you give me any uh, sort of timeline on that? Um, so I believe that the board has 100 days to issue their decision. So it uh, will be within that period of time where you would receive a written decision. And Ms. Liu will likely be your best point of contact when you might receive that decision after the board has issued it. Thank you. All right, any other questions before we get started? Not at this time, thank you. All right, then Ms. Liu, if you would please uh, give the board an orientation of the history of this matter and address the petition document. Thank you, Ron. On January 28, 1994, the board issued license number DC-23031 to the petitioner. The discipline that was taken against the petitioner's license was effective on May 30th, 2012, where the board revoked the license based upon the default decision and order in case number 2009-772, which called for the revocation of the petitioner's license. The disciplinary action was based on charges and allegations in an accusation filed on October 28th, 2009, which alleged as a first cause for discipline, criminal convictions on June 6, 2008 in USA versus Thomas Michael Classy, a criminal case filed in the United States District Court, Eastern District, case number 2-05-CR-00503-001 for violations of 18 USC section 1-52 subdivision three and two, false declaration under penalty of perjury in relations to a bankruptcy case. And then there was the 18 USC section 1-52 subdivision one and two, fraudulent concealment of property in connection with a bankruptcy case and 24 counts of violations of 18 USC section 1956 subdivision A, subdivision eight, subdivision I and two, money laundering to conceal the proceeds of a specific unlawful activity. And then there were two counts of violations of 18 USC section 1957 and two, engaging in monetary transactions over $10,000 in property derived from specific unlawful activities. The second cause for discipline dealt with the criminal conviction involving moral turpitude, dishonesty, physical violence, or corruption. The third cause for discipline, an act involving moral turpitude, dishonesty, or corruption. And the fourth cause for discipline was the participation in any act of fraud or misrepresentation. The cost recovery in that matter uh, is that because petitioner's license was revoked through a default decision, the board did not order cost recovery in this matter. There have been no previous petitions filed. Um, and with regard to continuing education pursuant to CCR Title 16, Section 365, petitioner has provided evidence of sufficient continuing education to fulfill the continuing education requirements for each year his license was revoked. 
through the date of his petition for reinstatement of his revoked license uh, from 2012 to 2022. Uh, with regard to the exhibits, um, the petitioner's uh, reinstatement packet, there is the petition for reinstatement of revoked license dated February 9th, 2021, the board's licensing details regarding the petitioner, the petitioner's license reinstatement questions that he answered, the petitioner's criminal case records from uh, the uh, Eastern District case, the Astegos, and that's spelled A-S-T-E-G-O-S dot org job offer, certificates of course completion, um, multiple certificates of course completion, letters of recommendation, and the board's default decision and order in case number 2009-722, the effective date of the revocation being May 30th, 2012, and the notice of hearing with proof of service. Because the burden is on the petitioner, I have no further statements, but I would reserve the right to question the petitioner. All right, the first thing I want to do is mark the petition package as Exhibit 1, and those are the documents that collectively make up the petition package, which Ms. Liu has identified. Dr. Classy, do you have any objections to any of those documents that make up the petition package, Exhibit 1? No, Your Honor. All right, Exhibit 1 is admitted. All right, Dr. Classy, I now need to swear you in so you can provide testimony to the board. If you please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please state and spell your name. Thomas Michael Classy, uh, T-H-O-M-A-S-M-I-C-H-A-E-L-K-L-A-S-S-Y. All right, Dr. Classy, just a couple reminders for you. We're, uh, some of us are appearing remotely, and so you are one of them. So it's going to be important that you keep your voice up. You speak a little more slowly than you're probably used to speaking in normal conversation. And the importance of doing that is to make sure that, uh, that the board members can hear you clearly. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, if you would focus your testimony on your rehabilitation efforts that you've undertaken since the revocation of your license, um, the board has the benefit of your petition package. They have all of that information that they have been able to review. So you don't need to repeat anything that's in there, but if there are things that you would like to direct the board members' attention to, you are certainly free to do so. All right, you may begin. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, we have a couple of different uh, things going on. One is a federal case, two is a state case, and the, where the laws aren't all exactly the same, um, uh, I did uh, have time to study the federal law since it was a federal case, and um, what, the, what the federal law requires is a post-conviction rehabilitation, and I think that's the same thing the state is asking for at this time. And so I'll go into that. Um, uh, first of all, while uh, in custody, I took every available class offered, uh, which was between nine and 12 per quarter. And um, culminating in, in a, a couple of hundred classes. Um, I also uh, graduated from uh, Chemeketa College in Salem, Oregon, in uh, their Microsoft Suite Certificate Program. Then I graduated from um, El Paso Community College uh, with their um, Automotive Maintenance Technology Program. And um, then I graduated from uh, College of Alameda in um, Aviation Maintenance Technology and continued on with Laney College in um, welding technology uh, and industrial technology uh, with the hope of being able to teach these programs at the junior college level. Um, uh, as Ms. Lu said, I uh, completed um, copious amounts of continuing education at the same time. 
and um, I believe that's all in your record. But this uh, entire case started with uh, the most contentious divorce case possible. And um, my divorce, my the last divorce lawyers I had uh, insisted I go bankrupt um, because I'd had a fire at my office and was not able to go to work. And um, I was handed down a $409,000 judgment in the divorce case with no way to pay it. So um, I did as the divorce lawyer asked and he in turn spoke with the, um, the bankruptcy lawyer who, um, who filled out the paperwork and, um, and uh, filed that those documents. So this was a divorce case personal and a personal bankruptcy had uh, nothing ever to do with my office or patients or anything like that. And I think Ms. Liu can attest to there's never been a complaint against my license uh, other than this. All right, Dr. Classy, I'm gonna ask Ms. Liu if she has any questions for you. And then as I mentioned, I will ask each of the board members if they have questions for you as well. And then if there's anything else you want to add at the end, you'll be able to do so also. Thank you. Ms. Liu, do you have any questions for Dr. Classy? Thank you, Your Honor. In your, so you have two matters pending, one in federal court, you say, and another in state court? No, ma'am. These are all been adjudicated, and that's why I'm here now. All right. So they're they're final, and everything's been completed. Yes. You nodded your head. Yes. <laughs> um, and you've uh, you paid the judgment in full. Um, very interesting. But I was handed down no uh, restitution and no fine in my federal case. Um, did you undergo any kind of counseling or therapy as a result of, of the uh, criminal convictions? Um, ongoing, yes. And to this date? Yes. Okay. And and how often do you do you go to counseling? Um, now at this point, it's down to an as needed basis, and uh, that has to be the first person I call at the end of this proceeding today. Um, so, are you saying that you've been in therapy since 2005? Um, those were uh, non-licensed individuals that had a PhD level, yes. And um, you say this was a, a contentious divorce. Um, are you, um, what is your relationship with your, your ex-wife at this time? I have not heard or seen of her in many years. And the, the therapy that you underwent, was that individual or was that group therapy? Um, it was mostly individual. Uh, was your therapy court ordered or was this something of your own volition? Uh, there was an opportunity through probation to uh, have probation pay for it, but it, this was all done on my own. What have you learned as a result of the therapy or counseling you received? That's a good question. I would say number one would be um, uh, just uh, don't trust lawyers. Uh, uh, read the information for yourself. Hold on. Dr. Classy, I'm not sure if anybody else heard this, but you cut out a bit. There was scratchy. Uh, yes, uh, I hear okay. that noise as well, Your Honor. Um, okay, let's let's start answer. over. Let's start over again. Um, the question is, what did you learn from counseling? If you could start your answer again. Well, number one, I would say, Ms. Liu, um, read all the documents word for word before signing. Number one, um, I just. Uh, yeah, it's just number one. If I'm going to sign it, I need to read it. Uh, 
And as a result of your convictions, how did this impact your your personal life other than the, the convictions and the incarceration? Um, uh, having difficulty finding food, lodging. Um, I've been homeless for years. Um, um, I think that's enough, isn't it? How long were you homeless for? Uh, I was released in um, September of 16, August of 16, excuse me, and uh, ha I got housing with the Stegos when I moved uh, to take this position that I'm still working at in Boise right now. So you're still living in as the uh, with the Estegos organization? I'm still in Boise, yes, working for Estegos, yes. It's uh, there's two contracts uh, if you want to know. One is a CSEP program, and the other one is um, AmeriCorps, which helps pay my student loans. Okay. I you know, I don't really know what the, the circumstances surrounding your, your convictions were, um, but there are multiple incidents of essentially fraud um, or false declarations, uh, money laundering. Um, can you address that a little bit? Um, it is my understanding after spending a lot of time on the federal law library that um, a bankruptcy comes from one period to another period. And uh, I, I filed and was given a judgment. And I believe that was January 3rd of 2004. And um, the money laundering uh, came after I had gone back to work and in a, uh, another county in California. And, um, they said that the money derived then, um, this is my understanding. The money derived then was, uh, of illegal gain. And, um, so, uh, just paying my first and second mortgages, um, amounted to that and all my bills every month amounted to over the $10,000 and that was considered illegal gains. Um, you had a license to practice at the time, correct? At that time, yes. Yes. 2004 uh, through 2009, but yeah, 2008 to 2009. Could you help me to understand why it was considered money laundering if you were if you were you had a a public practice that where you were licensed and how did that result in a conviction for money laundering miss lou i still can't figure the answer out to that okay and you had a lawyer and and uh, at the time who advised you and you, you pled to the charges, correct? I did not plead. I had a federal defender and was not allowed to put my property up to obtain a proper lawyer. Okay, so you had a, a, public def a federal public defender yes. and uh, who was representing you in this uh, federal criminal matter? Yes. Okay. And the the charge is money laundering to conceal the proceeds of specific of specified unlawful activity. What was the unlawful activity that you were convicted of trying to conceal or conceal? Uh, Miss Lou, again, I do not understand how they came up with this. Uh, I know that at one point, uh, because the fire was covered under my fire insurance, that I was given disbursements to help uh, clean up the mess of the fire and try to rebuild um, my practice. And in doing so, I was given a check 
in my adjusters that I had hired out of Sacramento called Greenspan International. The check was given to them and I would drive to Sacramento, sign that check. They would cash it and give me 10% less back. And I know that the, uh, the AUSA charged me with both of those checks separately on every issue. Okay. With regard to the, the two counts of engaging in monetary transactions over $10,000 in property derived from specific unlawful activities, what were the circumstances surrounding that, that charge? Again, Ms. Liu, if I would have understood what was going on, um, things could have been different. Um, I trusted that the federal defender and um, the litigator that was handling my case um, was doing a, a good job, but um, again, they wouldn't let me bring a witness forth in my case. So Do I, you... I don't understand. Okay. Um, I'm still not not clear on the circumstances surrounding your your conviction, and part of the rehabilitative process is to be able to discuss it, to talk about it, and also, you know, for us to truly understand those circumstances. You know, I would like to know, you know, what's the possibility of recurrence as well, but your Why don't you why don't you just tell us in your own words what you did wrong? If anything. Well, yes, I, uh, there is um, there is part that I didn't do and I didn't read those documents before I signed them. I had an appointment with my uh, bankruptcy attorney, Dennis Cowan in Redding, California. I went down there. He was not in his office and I made um, uh, made it known that he had made an agreement with me to meet me and go over those documents. And um, his secretary said he got called out and that if I just signed where the post -it notes asked me to, that everything would be okay. And she literally put her hand over the document, exposed, or covering the body of the document and said, just sign here. And I was a bit flustered at, you know, we had had an agreement to meet and I signed the documents and I didn't read them. Uh, Ms. Lou, my, I think my biggest, my biggest fault was not reading something that I was signing that was going before a court and the, the weight of those documents have put um, uh, the most unbearable uh, hardship on me of my life. So are you blaming your bankruptcy attorney for somehow no. having you signed documents that no, you did not I'm agree blaming to? myself for not reading those documents. Did you file a complaint with the state bar against your, your bankruptcy attorney? No, he's got to be close to 80 years old now. Um, I don't think he's in practice anymore. No. So, other than blaming yourself for not having had read these, these documents um, before they were submitted to court, what, what, if any other admissions do you make of any wrongdoing on your part? Ms. Lou, this was the most contentious divorce this ca county in California had ever seen. The Board of Supervisors were coming to me just going, I don't understand what's going on. And I said, I don't either. And I went through several lawyers trying to, to uh, get a better understanding and that just all I got was just do this, just do that. Now, I'm not blaming anybody else for my not understanding. 
I, I should have stopped what I was doing and, um, and uh, help into this to the, the degree with which I've tried to dig myself out of this. Um, I, uh, again, I don't blame anybody else in this case. It is what it is. I know that nobody else was going to to dig my way out of this. I, I did every class, honestly, all the way through school. I did the same to, to get out of this. Um, I was the first person in my class to have all of my student loans paid for. Um, if I know how the game is played, I have, um, all the uh, wherewithal to play within the rules. I just didn't know uh, what I was dealing with. So, so are you then denying that there was any fraudulent concealment of property in connection with your bankruptcy case? No, Miss Lou. Again, I am. This was. You have no idea. We filed for divorce in two thousand. I got a default judgment in um, 2003 and um, would have been, I don't know, somewhere around the middle of the year, 2003. And my new lawyer said, you have 30 days left to file bankruptcy or they're going to come after you and you will never be able to get out from underneath this. It's a $409,000 cash um, uh, default judgment. And um, again, uh, I, I was jailed for contempt several times because the, my ex had said that we had a child or she had custody of a minor child. And I said there was no child. There, there, it, there isn't and there wasn't. Um, again, um, these were legal maneuvers that I did not understand. And I had some time to understand. I'm smart enough that I can read things and understand them. And um, had I read every, uh, every paper and document, I would have had a much better understanding and I wouldn't be where I am today. Can you tell us what sort of rehabilitative measures you have undertaken uh, since your conviction? Yes, um, right from the start, all I was allowed to have was a Bible. And I started reading that Bible from cover to cover, copyright date and everything. And then I picked up another edition and started reading that. At the same time, I was going deep with inside me asking God for help and what do I need to do? And I just kept reading version after version um, like I should have done those documents. Um, and um, got a better understanding of myself. Then um, finding everybody in the counseling, uh, social welfare and psychology fields um, asked if they would talk with me about myself and these issues. And I have uh, since continued. I also at the same time wanted to go through um, every, well, let, I'll back up a little bit. Um, my my faith um, uh, if it made a difference with the um, knowing um, is what's called messianic jew um, so um, believing the old testament as well as the new testament uh, as a guidance for us on earth uh, as god would have intended us so i i stayed with that and um uh, when I had nothing else, I would read a dictionary or an encyclopedia if I could get one. But uh, 
then I started in with the schools, every school that I could take. And that comes from um, uh, some of the code of federal regulations on what you're supposed to do to rehabilitate. So I made sure that I did more than um, many times over uh, on the federal law as far as rehabilitation, uh, including you trying to utilize the California State Department of Rehabilitation who gets the federal funds, including probation. If you read the letter from Estegos, there's also a letter from United States probation um, uh, terminating my probation early because of my exemplary work and being able to take this job at a nonprofit that feeds homeless every day of the year. And I've been there for over three years now. Have you done, uh, I mean, you, the way that what I am understanding your testimony to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you pled, or rather you signed off on some bankruptcy documents at the advice of your lawyer and or staff at his office and that you you signed off on them without truly understanding them or really re reading them. And those bankruptcy documents resulted in your federal conviction, correct? Yes. And that you didn't, you didn't, because you didn't read it and because you don't really understand it, um, I, I just want to know, have you done anything to try to undo the paperwork that you signed with your bankruptcy lawyer? We have filed an appeal and the appeal went before the Ninth Circuit uh, down at the Federal Browning Building and 7th Street in San Francisco. They um, they said that the, uh, the case had to be resentenced. It was resentenced. The federal judge uh, in Sacramento um, uh, did uh, the minimal amount of reduction in sentence, and um, that was the end of it. Um, I couldn't go any farther. There was there no money to do that, and the federal defender doesn't do any more than that. So, you so it didn't change your your conviction. Uh, it didn't. It did actually lower the. The, the points level, the federal system goes on a points level. It did lower that and lower my time to be served as well. But uh, the total overall outcome, no. And, and again, I don't want you to think that I'm saying that I am not uh, uh, culpable in this. That's not what I'm saying. I, we all have made mistakes through the years, through growing and living. My mistakes were out in the open where everybody could see. And so um, I, don't, I, I don't know how else to say, I'm not saying I'm not culpable. I'm not saying I'm not guilty in any way, Ms. Lou. That is not it. What I'm saying is I did what I thought was right and I didn't do what was really right, which was to actually read every document before I signed it. Um, um, I trusted the authorities in the area. For gosh sakes, my uh, bankruptcy lawyer uh, was a Harvard grad and practiced for 40 years. He did my first divorce 30 years prior to this bankruptcy. Um, uh, it seemed like in my case, everybody knew everybody years in advance, including my judge everybody but that's that's not saying that i am not culpable i'm not saying that i i had an obligation to read those documents to uh to change them if i had to even though they had to be filed that afternoon um i i didn't do my part Ms. Lou, I just want to have you be mindful. It's 1.43. We have a one hour, one hour for this hearing, and I want to make sure that the board members have plenty of time to answer questions. There are two additional hearings on, on the schedule. So just please be mindful of that. It's 1.43. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I don't have any further questions of, of this witness. Thank All you. Right, I'm, I'm going to ask our board members, starting with Dr. Adams, if you have any questions. 
I have no questions, uh, Judge Larson. All right, then. Um, with uh, next in order, then, um, uh, Mr. Sweet, do you have any questions for um, Dr. Classy? No, I don't think I do at this time. Thank you. All right, and uh, Ms. Ms. Cruz is with us as well, correct? Mm -hmm. and no, any questions. Questions? no questions. No uh, questions. Any questions, Dr. Daniels? Uh, yes, I just have a hopefully a quick question. Um, you've clearly studied a lot of other um, areas, so um, I'm just curious uh, why you want to come back to the profession. That's a great question. Um, the federal government has a program called ONET, O-N-E-T, and it is to help find the best aptitude and preference for uh, every individual. Uh, through the years, I was able to, to take this O-N-E-T, uh, aptitude and preference test, and uh, in every uh, uh, six-month period, uh, it came up with the um, uh, that I was best suited and adept for uh, every doctor in every field. Um, and that's one. Number two, uh, actually number very one, was uh, at seven years old, I got my first adjustment and um, uh, was a life-changing experience. And uh, not just the torticollis was relieved immediately, but so was the enuresis. So I am what we call in chiropractic, the chiropractic miracle from my first adjustment. Um, there's nothing else I wanted to do more uh, in my entire life. And um, so I have always kept my hand in it. Some of the courses I took when I was unable to do any chiropractic was I joined the American uh, Society for Radiologic Technologists and did all of their continuing ed. Um, that I could during that time, like uh, four times what everybody else was doing, and um, just to stay on top of all of it. So number one would be my, I'm a chiropractic miracle. Number two, um, I had some of the greatest mentors in our field as uh, as close friends, and um, they always encouraged me. Um, and supported me in uh, going through chiropractic. I uh, there's nothing else I'd rather do. That's that's the answer. Thank you. And just one more question. So you've been out of the profession for a while. Do you feel like you are um, your skills are ready to practice? Yes. And and my main goal here because uh, I'm 69 years old. My main goal is to do relief work or what we call locum tenens. Um, in the area where I am in Boise, uh, all I have to do is if I have an active California license, I can literally walk down to the state building and pay the fee and I will be uh, granted a, an active license in Idaho. I have friends in California that want me to do relief work for them that have known me for many years. Um, and uh, one of them wrote a letter and is in your packet. Uh, another one is a psychologist uh, that wrote a letter most recently. Uh, her husband is a nurse anesthetist. They're friends of mine as well. And um, they want to see me back in practice as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. No more questions. All right, any other questions from uh, our Judge board members? Yeah, Judge Larson, I just, I, I actually came full circle. I'm, I'm, I just have one question, and that is, uh, Dr. Classy, since the revocation of your license, have you uh, adjusted any, uh, any individuals? Well, what we do is we do what's called a setup, and I took a, a lot of my continuing ed through Marcus Strutz and back to chiropractic. And in Marcus's um, demonstrations, we we do setups in there and practice now. My first. So you, so you haven't. I, we're 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 kind of on a time crunch. Uh, your answer then is that you have provided no thrust into a human spine since the revocation of your license. Anybody coming before this board that says that you did would be untruthful. Is that your testimony? That is not my testimony. 
My okay. testimony is that uh, if someone's bone moved, that was not my intention. But yes, I have practiced with licensed doctors under their license on them. So it's your testimony that you have adjusted licensed chiropractors providing a chiropractic adjustment to licensed chiropractors that have given you permission to do that? And have asked me to do so, not just permission, but asked me to help. And you recognize that with the revocation of your license that that's a direct violation of the revocation of your license to adjust anybody, even if they give you permission? At that point, I am working as an assistant under their license, and I have read all the laws in both states about a chiropractic assistant can follow the doctor's orders. I have no other questions. Thank you. Any other questions from our board members uh, for Dr. Classy? Yes, I, I'm sorry, I have one more question, Dr. Daniel. Yeah. Um, Dr. Classy, in the packet that you provided um, on a lot of the uh, CEs, there's, um, for example, you have, it's BCE00137, you have Zoom hours for technique with struts October 24th, and then on the next page, uh, it's also October 24th for technique, and then on the, are you, are these the same exact classes? Did you no, Dr. copy you can, them? No, sir. You know, ma'am, you can do up to 12 hours in a 24 hour period. Uh, correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions from uh, our board members? Ms. Lou, anything further? Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything you want to add before closing remarks, Dr. Classy? Yes, Your Honor. Um, through this whole process, I have made mistakes. Um, again, I don't think any one of us is, is above making a mistake in life. Um, I just ask that the board not make this a life sentence to me. Please, please have mercy. Right, closing remarks, Ms. Liu. Submitted, Your Honor. All right, Dr. Classy, is the matter submitted for the board's consideration? Yes. All right, the matter is submitted and the record is closed. All right, thank you, Dr. Classy, you are free to go. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Valerie, could you please notify Dr. Paris? Uh, he can re come back in. Thank you. Your Honor, is it okay if we just take a couple of people may need to go take a little break? Is that all right if we're off the record for or? Of course, whatever you do. Two or three minutes? Time. Of course, absolutely. All right, thank you.